I'm not here to convince you about anything. I'm not going to argue about you know, particular points. I'm very opinionated about some points, and you will figure it out pretty soon. But I'm, I'm just here to arouse maybe some curiosity in you about the type of topics, about the policy issues that I would like to discuss. And I'm going to talk about not politics, but policy. And I'm going to talk about economic policy and not other type of policies. I'm not talking about foreign policy or education policy, but something that I've spe specialized in the last eight years or so, economic policy. I would like to stimulate your thinking about a bit, about just a bit, uh, so that you can perhaps have a framework uh, that you can apply um, to your everyday lives when you're reading thousands of articles on Wall Street Journal or Financial Times, where you can, you know, I'm sure you get exposed to whole different, um, whole different um, uh, media and uh, you, uh, hear many different opinions from a lot of people. Most of them does, don't make sense, and most of them silly, in my opinion, when you really know the kind of people who develop this kind of thinking. So that's what I wanted to do. And, um, and I wanted to also kind of um, uh, uh, help you a little bit, if I can. You know, This might be a bit daring, but maybe kind of to understand the economic uh, discussions without getting bogged down in the jargon and the statistics. And so kind of take you to the top level of what the stake, what is at stake here? What are the choices? What are we talking about in the whole world? And, um, and let me give you one more reason why I picked the subject, and that will be it, and enough babbling on this issue. I have talked to, you know, I have a lot of, obviously, a lot of uh, female friends, and most of my friends actually run um, their family budgets. You know, most of the women that I know, I come from a very matriarchal family where women pretty much decide on anything that's financial. But most of my friends are exactly in the same position in their families. So, and they make prior, they set priorities every single day. They know financial constraints within their families. They plan, uh, they are cautious, they are sober, they're prudent. Yet the same women, when I talk to them kind of casually about national economic issues or world economic issues, they act like there are no constraints. They act like the economic resources are unlimited. They act like, um, you know, almost like um, they completely leave that sober attitude of themselves within their families and get into this kind of almost like wishful thinking land about how the world should be run. So I found that fascinating. You know, I thought, you know, while Angela Merkel is running the European economy uh, on the other side of the pond, maybe I thought some other women should chip in, you know, into these issues and kind of develop their thinking about how our governments should be run and how our, our national budgets should be made and what kind of priorities we should set. So those are the reasons why I selected this topic. So that makes half of my speech already. So um, now, um, I want to... I wanna, um, Take a little survey of the crowd here, because I don't know each and every one of you. I don't know what kind of backgrounds you, you have. So can you please put your hands up? How many of you um, have been aware or kind of you, you think that you're aware of the financial crisis in the United States that we are still uh, living through? How many of you are aware of it? How many of them you, you are following it? OK, quite a few of you. How many of you think that you actually truly understand what the hell is going on? One, two, OK? Very few. Let me ask you another question. How many of you are following developments in Europe, the fiscal crisis in Europe? Well, you can't avoid it, right? It's all over media every day, OK? Uh, quite a lot. How many of you truly understand or truly think that they actually understand what the hell is going on in Europe? One. Very few. It's fascinating, isn't it? You know, such important topics. We read them, them, you know, we read about them every single day. Oh my God, everybody's talking about it. Yet we just don't feel confident enough that we understand what's going on. And let me tell you up front, I'm not going to be giving you the magic formula to understand all the things, but I'll just give you a framework. So let me start with some very, very brief historical perspective. We talk about, you know, everybody's talking about in the Western world right now about um, the, his, about, quote, historic power shifts in the world. They talk about the tectonic plates under the Western democratic capitalistic societies moving. These are not my words. They talk about the failure of our systems. They talk about Chinese capital, you know, capitalism with Chinese characteristics, whatever that means, and we'll get to that later. They talk about the end of the world as we know it. 
They talk about the complete utter paralysis in the Western democratic capitalistic systems. This is what people are talking about. And, um, and, and I would argue, actually, maybe modestly, that actually nothing that we're debating right now is new under the sun. I would argue, on the, on the contrary, that the debates that we are having right now is actually one of the many debates that has started, one of the many recessions that has happened, one of the many policy uh, dilemmas we have faced since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Nothing has changed. The, the choices are essentially the same. And the choices, I will argue, are basic. The choices are economic growth, economic liberty and opportunity versus economic security and more government. I will repeat. The real choices are here is more government and more security on one side and more growth, economic liberty, and more opportunity on the this other side. So hold that thought, because I will come and visit that later. Now, um, and I would argue it basically has never changed. This is the same debate. Now, um, since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, very brief, brief history. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to start rolling your eyes thinking that I'm just going to go back to the start of the humanity. But since the start of the Industrial Re Revolution in the UK back in 1840s, okay, we have been debating pretty much the, the we have been grappling uh, with the consequences of uh, the dramatic increase in the innovation, in technological innovation, and hence the productivity of our societies. So what? So. You need to understand, right before Industrial Revolution, for about thousands of years, for about a thousand years, the economic growth in the world was essentially zero. Think about it. So pretty much nothing changed for about a thousand years. And think about what kind of a stagnant environment it was. You know, basically the, the you know, religion ruled the world. You know, people thought of the economy just like weather. You know, you have no control over it. It's God's will. You know, God knows, you know, there, you know, it's frequently, you know, economic, uh, there's not much growth anyway. The, uh, the, your economic life is frequently um, uh, kind of um, uh, hampered by disasters. You know, there are depressions, there's a famine, you know, you know, all sorts of low production of agricultural output. So people thought of all of this, this topic to be out, completely out of their control. So when Industrial Revolution happened, and when productivity of the society dramatically increased, and, the, and the basically the standards of life started increasing, and people started finding more food, and you know, the increasing their quality of standards, it's it, a completely different debate started that never existed before. And that debate was, how do we manage this economy, and do we, can we manage economic growth? Do we, can we do it, first of all? And if we can, how do we do it, and how do we share the, uh, the fruits of this incre increased productivity in the society. And in this whole process, there have been you know, marvelous economic th thinkers. I'm not going to take you all through all of them. But we have learned so many things. Um, we have, um, um, you know, and every single, and every single step in this learning process has actually caused by a lot of pain and misery. You know, every time uh, there was an economic depression, there was unemployment, there were, there were basically hunger, there were soup kitchens, there was unemployment. You know, it was always learned by a lot of pain. And sometimes, you know, some of, in some cases, we have made um, disastrous decisions. I mean, as uh, Paul is saying, we meaning citizens of the world, of the Western, uh, Western societies, we made disastrous decisions. You know, one, you know, just so many examples come to mind, but, you know, perfect example, for example, example is in the early uh, 1930s, the Smoot-Hawley Act, where basically going through an economic depression, the United States government decided to pretty much kill the world trade, and basically it, it, you know, uh, it created spasms throughout the economic system. Or during the Great Depression, uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s, for example, Fed makes disastrous policy mistakes, and um, they basically limit the money supply prematurely. They let the banking system fail in front of their eyes, and you know they pretty much extended the Great Depression for another eight years or so. Or I mean, uh, or we have think about it. We have experimented with a system called communism in in the significant parts of the world. I mean, it's a system whereby you know it was 
basically, um, it's some type of a kind of, I'm not going to mince my words, it's some type of slavery. And people actually had to go through that system for about 70 years to learn the mistakes from that. So a lot of mistakes have been done, but the debate has never really changed, have never really changed. So the debate is, how do you manage economic growth? Can you manage it? How do you share the wealth? How do you increase productivity? And how you make sure that you have economic opportunity for the next generations? So I want to make one more point on this, and I'm going to come to more like recent history. It's very important. The reason I'm kind of going on and on about this issue, because it's very important to understand the implications of the thinking on the economic policy. Think about it. If you, um, sorry, I had to add one more point. I forgot about it. Um, for example, one of the major learnings that we have, um, uh, we have gathered within the 20th century was that you cannot just um, let your neighbors or your other countries, and you, it's, the economic system is so interconnected and so interrelated, you cannot just let another country uh, implode on itself economically and think that you're just going to be you know, having a party in your own nation, you know, safely within your borders. I mean, that idea, obviously, when the Second World War hit, you know, the, before even the world, world started, the economic thinkers knew, understood why there was a Second World War, because they understood that the Germany, having militarily completely overtaken by the European, uh, by the British and the French and the led for the other side, was you cannot expect Germany to be militarily beaten and also expect Germany to pay you the cost of the war, the First World War. Obviously, that was not going to work. And the whole, the, the learnings of all of these mistakes that has been done politically, economically, went into the thinking of the systems as well. So we improved. It's always a trial and error, so we improved the system. And then, you know, and hence my point to the implications of this. Think about it. All of these, all of these um, learnings led us to the uh, uh, to the establishment of European Union. We're talking about it every day. They decided that, you know, we, it, you, know econo you know, economic growth is really about cooperation. This is not a zero-sum game, and therefore let's get together. That's European Union. Think about the understanding of economic uh, learning in Russia and China and India. Think about the reduction of poverty for hundreds of millions of people. Or think about the the result of this understanding that you don't need somebody else's natural resources to become prosperous. You know, you don't need oil or you don't need gold or platinum or diamonds under your soil to become prosperous. It's all about building a system where the citizen who have the talent, the ideas, and, to, and, and sometimes the luck to, uh, while they're trying to maximize their own interests and their own wealth, led the growth and increase the productivity of the whole society. So this was a revolutionary thought, and it still is. And it is again takes us to the, um, to the same debate of how we manage economic growth. Now, another thing, and another implication on this, and then I'm coming to the re, uh, you know, recent history, I promise. Uh, you know, people talk about the fact that you know, the level of violence all around the world has decreased significantly. You know, it doesn't sound like it when you actually look, you know, turn on the TV or read the newspaper. But actually, the number of people in the world killed in violence is now, it's completely insignificant compared to the number of people killed in violence around the world during the Middle Ages. Why? Because people understood, you know, what is at stake about economic growth. Because people understood that you don't need to kill your neighbor to become prosperous. This is, again, not a zero-sum game. So these things have profound implications in the world history and in the world we live in, and it will have profound implications in our grandchildren's lives. And it's important to understand the importance of these issues and get knowledgeable about it. So now we have, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, that I'm arguing that the debates that we're having right now, you know, going through this financial crisis, watching the Europeans, you know, basically shoot themselves in the foot, you know, the issues are again, again the same. So the question is, you know, how do we govern ourselves? What kind of roles should government play in our, in our societies? How do we, you know, what is exactly the role of government anyway? Is it just about, um, you know, uh, keeping our borders safe, having an army, poli you know, doing policing, you know, doing firefighting? Is it education? Should government be also an agent to transfer wealth from one part of the society to the other. I mean, these are questions that we should think about and we should be aware about. And how, there are also, you know, the, the issue of taxation. How much governments should be able, legally, to take our money out of our pockets? 
how much of this can really they, you know, the government can get away with without affecting growth and oppor economic opportunity? You know, is there a natural limit to this? Or how much, you know, how much of this, how much broader can government get, get without stifling free enterprise and our economic liberties? So how does that happen? Where, is the, where are the inflection points? What kind of choices do we have? So these are important points, I think. Now, and also one thing that while we're um, you know, debating this subject, there, there are a couple of points that we need to be careful about. I believe um, that, uh, first of all, we need to understand that while we're talking about these issues, we should, not uh, we should not only look at the face value of the ideas that's presented to us. We need to not only talk about, and I'll give you some more examples, but let me give you the idea. Not the, just um, the face value of what the objective of a policy is, but what could potential unintended consequences of that policy could possibly be? That was a bad sentence. Um, so what are the unintended consequences of this? Or, um, or can actually, or what are the tertiary consequences? Or um, um, can it, uh, when we're talking about something that we want it to be delivered, say, by the government or by the business sector or whatnot, can it really be delivered? Can it really be measured? Or is this the best way of delivering that result that we are talking about or we are debating that we should deliver, for example? These are the kind of questions that we should ask, in my opinion. Now, um, I, in my opinion, and that is my personal opinion only, and I'm, I'll be happy to debate, um, because the whole objective is to start a debate on this anyway. But I would argue that in, in our recent, for the, in, for the, within the next, ten, uh, within the last 10 years or so, the pendulum in this debate has moved too much towards having more government and too, and basically too much, uh, too little for economic freedoms. That's my, that's my argument, that's my personal opinion. But I would like to give you two examples, two examples that I think could be relevant um, to your current thinking uh, that makes me think so. First, I want to talk about the financial crisis in the US. And second, I want to talk about the, the indebtedness, sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And so let me start with US and give you the kind of framework whereby I think about these issues. Now, as you know, the 2008 financial crisis was caused by um, mortgages, especially uh, subprime mortgages, as they're called, in the uh, housing industry, right? Um, I'm sure you also know that housing industry and the mortgage industry are one of the most heavily regulated industries in this country. Most heavily re regulated. There are very few industries of this sort that we can find. Now, the, the story that we heard, you know, especially during the 2008 election campaign, which, you know, everything becomes politicized, as you know, is basically there are two, two narratives here. One, the narrative on, on relatively the kind of center left or left is it's because of financial deregulation. That's why, you know, banks ran amok. And also this story is also enhanced by the you know, grand, uh, giant vampire squid uh, story, as I call it, is basically these greedy fat cat bankers uh, with no respect to human, you know, human heart or human existence actually try to kind of enrich themselves and therefore this, we have this crisis and God, you know, we should, we should punish them and we should regulate them more, by the way. That's one story. The second story on the right is, you know, this is really what happened after the crisis, a giant power grab by the government. They're, you know, kind of limiting our, uh, our economic liberties. It should not be tolerated, whatnot. Now, I would like to take us both, uh, all of us, if I can, just beyond all of these narratives and kind of start thinking about housing policy in very simple terms. And I hope that this example will illustrate what kind of thinking that I'm, I, I would like to illustrate. Now, there are very few things in this country that both sides of the political aisle can agree, can agree on. There are very few things. But one of the things that both sides very agreed very strongly is that people, you know, it, it's very good policy to have poor people own their homes. And the more that you can own, you know, have more poor people own their homes, the better the society is. Right? It sounds wonderful. Now let's continue with this thinking. The left side of the aisle thinks it's good economic policy because once you have poor people own their, um, own their homes, they become better citizens because now they have a vested interest in the community, right? 
That's completely plausible. It makes a lot of sense. Now, so therefore, we should promote home ownership. We should push this to the extent that we can. Now, the right side of the, hand of the, uh, right side of the aisle, politically, thinks that it's good policy. Why? Because they look at the statistics, and 85% of the people who own their home vote Republican. So of course they agree. It's a good policy, right? Because they vote for me, and therefore we should all get together and promote home ownership among poor people. Now, this is a very interesting thinking, right? Because it's a perfect example of correlation and causality being confused. Let me ask you the question. Do people become good citizens because they own their home? Or is because people are already good citizens, they own their home? Look, we just had a hit of about $10 trillion in the world econo economy about this issue. You better think about these things, right? Now, now that people are kind of started sort of thinking like maybe Maybe now that you look all around the world, the home ownership rates, like in Spain, it's 80%. It's Turkey, I mean, a country that most of us know about, it's above 70%. The home ownership rate in the US has never went above 68%. Never. At the top of that housing boom, when the, when the average you know, housing prices was going up about 8, 14, 14 and a half percent a year in real terms, the home ownership rate went up to 68%, and now it's about 64% never went about maybe and this is despite all of these you know trillions of dollars actually thrown at this idea and you know we have Freddie and Fannie the government sponsored enterprises we have mortgage reduction uh, mortgage uh, interest rate reduction and on taxes so there are a lot of built in um, uh, policy uh, things incentives for people to actually own their homes and despite that the maximum was 68 percent why Maybe there is a natural reason that, that is maybe related to the, to the makeup of the American population, where people tend to be more risk takers. There are a lot of, it's a mobile society. You know, the poor people relatively come from the bottom and look up, you know, come up. And there is a flux in the, in, the, in, in the population, unlike some other countries in the world. Maybe there is a natural reason this was, the, this, this was the case. And let me take the argument one level further. When you get a little wealthy, the first thing you know you do is you know obviously you invest a little bit hopefully, and uh, because you want to get the you know get the return on your capital, and you get a financial advisor, right? The first thing your financial advisor says is what? You have to diversify, right? You got to diversify. They actually tell you, unless you're ultra high net worth, which means you have millions and zillions of dollars in the bank, unless you're extremely wealthy, you should actually keep about six months of your, uh, of your uh, living expenses in a liquid account so that, God forbid, if you get sick, you need to you know, get you know, a treatment, or if you lose your job, for about six months, you can handle your life and you can cover the expenses of your family so you're not on, your, on the street, right? Those are the two rules. And these two, two basic rules are being told to every single middle to high income person in the world. So diversification is very important, and you should not put all of your eggs in one basket. Yet, yet, as a government policy, we want people to put all of their eggs in one basket. We want them to not diversify and to actually own their homes. So if, when they, if and when, and they actually frequently lose their job, unfortunately, when they lose their job, they cannot move to another state to find a house. So my question is, are we really doing a service to poor people by forcing them prematurely to own their homes? So this is the kind of thinking I'm talking about when I'm talking about economic policy. So it's actually not taking the policy objectives at face value, but thinking about the intended, unintended consequences, maybe tertiary impacts of those things on people's lives. And trying to find out what exactly we're trying to achieve here. I would argue that, you know, you know, the you, have wonder, you might have wonderful objectives to improve other people's lives through economic policy and through government, but in, in most cases, not all, and we can you know, talk about hours on this issue, but in most cases, you're actually damaging and hurting the very, peop few peop very people that you say you want to help. Now, let me give you another example. It's kind of the room got kind of gloomy. 
So let me give you another example. The, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. What's going on? And oh my God, I mean, it's a complete mess. God knows what's going on. But, um, but I want to take you, give you a very brief historical perspective. And so that kind of put, kind of put things into perspective for you. The European governments are, uh, the European economies are suffering from uh, low growth and has been suffering from low growth for many, many years right now. Uh, this is not a new issue. Um, we can debate this for hours. Uh, I would argue that it's mostly high taxation, too much government, and too little growth. And if you just, you can't have that level of security and all those lovely entitlements and pension plans and fantastic, you know, you know unlimited health care and all of that and not have a growth problem, okay? But let me talk very briefly about that entitlement and the impact and the sec and unintended consequences of that in the European societies. And I'll make two points and I'll stop at that. This whole entitlement welfare state idea was actually masterminded by a brilliant politician, um, policy strategist, you know, and you can come up with, you know, 100 different lovely adjectives for this, for this gentleman named Bismarck. He was a pro pro Prussian um, policymaker. He, when he took, when he got into the authority, of being the chancellor of Germany. He had no administrative role, and he was facing with a uh, major rivalry from Russia versus France. And anyway, he never held a military position, but he always walked around in military uniform. God knows why. But about this entitlement thing, he, he came up with an idea that was brilliant for his age. And we are living the consequences of his idea right now. He, he was trying to unify Germany. Uh, he, Germany at the time had about 37 or 39 princes. They hated each other. They never wanted to get together. So they needed to uh, actually go below the princes and make the appeal to the citizens themselves. So he came up with the following idea. Look, why don't you guys come together and push your own princes to join Germany, uh, to unify Germany under one roof, and I'll give you a goodie for this. You're going to get into the system. I'm going to make sure that you get paid fantastic pensions and, you know, in your old age. And the young people who live in Germany right now will pay for you. You don't have to pay a dime into the system, but you'll get all these wonderful benefits. Brilliant, right? It was, and it went on. It was, it was a brilliant idea. It still was a brilliant idea until the shit hit the fan about 120 years later, believe it or not. Because what happened? What you do with this kind of a system is that the old, at the time, you know, the young people pay for all of the benefits of the old people. So you basically roll down the cost of this program down the generations. But there are two big problems about this that Ms. Mark probably didn't even think about. One, this system is a slave to the demogra demographics of the country, right? So that you always need to have more young people and you always need the population to grow. Well, does that ring the bell? It's no longer the case, right? You know, Germany is already getting old. Italy is already the case. Germany is on the way, and this is a problem we're going to face in, in America in about 15 years. So that one rule actually was uh, taken. It was was actually was, was was a flaw in the idea. Second rule, second thing, problem about Bismarck's idea was that you did not have the wealth effect on this. And let me explain what I'm trying to say. When you put hundred dollars in the bank, if you get your interest compounded over the years you know, you get the wealth effect. So if you're a young person and if you're putting your own pensions, you're saving and putting $100 on the, on, on, the, on the side today, and you actually tap into those savings many years later, your, the money you have in the bank account is not $100 anymore. It's thousands of dollars because of the compound annual rate, right? But if you actually just take from the young guy and give exactly the same $100 to the old guy, which is basically a transfer, then you don't have the wealth effect because the $100 is still $100. So Bismarck's idea was, sounded great for very, very many years, but now it's no longer a good idea. And we're living the, with the consequences of his, you know, of these economic policies. So we need to think about these things. We need to think about how much of this we can, we can tolerate and we can afford within the, within the system. And we need to understand the political implications of this. There is another thing I would like to highlight to this, and then I'm going to just make my closing remarks. I've already talked way too much. 
The economic growth is not only important because you want to be prosperous. Economic growth is important because if you don't have it, you have, uh, you have a lack of social progress that has various implications. You know, I keep going on and on about economic growth, and, uh, but I want to I kind of just illustrate uh, uh, why it is so important. It's not only, economic growth does not only provide wealth, prosperity, and more economic opportunity um, to the younger generations and to the society, and therefore hopefully more happiness. It only creates an environment where you can have social progress. The type of countries that cannot achieve economic growth for extended periods of time are relatively speaking more xenophobic. Think about it. The societies that cannot achieve uh, economic growth for extended periods of time tend to be more inward looking. They're not the kind of societies that you want to be part of. They're not kind of, they're not happening. The art scene is not that exciting. Uh, you know, they're just the young people are migrating. Look at Italy for the last 10 years. I mean, look at Japan. I mean, no, no expatriate wants to live in Japan. It's so difficult. Um, anyway, this is a subject that I, and I don't want to go off the, off the subject that, um, that way. Now, let me kind of wrap up my comments because I think we talk, I talked about a whole bunch of things and covered a whole, very broad, um, um, very broad uh, spectrum of, um, of issues. I want to leave you with a couple of ideas. One is that while when you're talking about um, economic policy in general, please try to remember that the debate uh, on economic policies has not necessarily changed much over the, over the years. And the debate still remains to be the choice between economic liberty, economic freedom, and opportunity versus economic security and more government. So that's number one. Number two, that while when you're looking into economic policies and when you listen to policymakers talking about their objectives and their plans and programs, Try to apply your logic to what they're saying. Don't take what they're saying uh, uh, as their face value. Try to understand the consequences of the, pl the programs. Try to think about the unintended consequences of those programs. Think about how people would react to those programs. Remember, human beings are fallible. We make mistakes. You know, we are not perfect. We are not perfect creatures. So, and people really act along, uh, along with their interests. So remember to apply that logic and that filter to the economic policy programs that you hear. The third uh, topic that I would like to leave you with is that just like your family budget, the economic resources are always restricted. There are never unlimited, and there are always choices to be made. And if somebody tells you that there are no hard choices to be made, don't believe them. There are always priorities that need to be set, and therefore there is no free lunch. And if somebody tells you so, don't believe it. And my last thought is that this debate is a healthy debate, although it feels very gloomy right now all around the world, and especially in the developed economies. This debate will... Um, will take place and we will improve our system, we'll make it better, we will revisit our assumptions and we will build a system that is better. This is just a process and we're really beginning uh, to realize what we're doing here. It's really 100 and what, 50 years of capitalist development. We're just, just starting this process. And, and as King Solomon said very wisely, this too shall pass. So let me leave it at that. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my comments and my mumblings. And I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have on this topic. Thank you.